end of the presentation. Um, I will do this as close to the end before the Q&A starts, so as many people as possible can be included. Um, I apologize if that is distracting as the webinar is concluding. If you could please complete and return it um, to us, that will be great. And if you have any other questions or comments, send me an email and I'll reply. We will be re uh, presenting webinars twice a month starting in September. Check our website for details and to register. They're always on Tuesdays at one o'clock. As they say in Game of Thrones, winter is coming, but you can be ready with a 100% cotton long sleeve t-shirt featuring the Levy Senior Center Foundation. If you're local, I'll deliver it. And if not, I'll mail it. All for $15. We have many larges and extra larges, and they're really comfortable. And now on with our show. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Meep Hees. She is the fifth person, was the fifth person, to be honored with the Wallenberg Medal from the University of Michigan. This award, this medal is awarded to outstanding humanitarians whose actions on behalf of the defenseless and oppressed reflect the heroic commitment and sacrifice of Raoul Wallenberg. Raoul, a Swedish diplomat, graduated from the University of Michigan in 1935 with a degree in architecture. 11 years later, Raoul rescued tens of thousands of Jews in Budapest during the last months of World War II. Let us join Meep at the University of Michigan where she receives the 1994 Wallenberg Medal. Ladies, gentlemen, and children, I am deeply moved by the warm welcome you have extended to me, and I am very grateful for all courtesies. For me, the best thing is to meet people who share my views about our human duty to help those who are in trouble. Please do not look up to me. It does embarrass me very much. Kindly consider yourself to be my equal in providing support to all who live in fear and pain. Please. People often ask for me to say to them where I found the courage to help the Frank family. Yes. It certainly does require courage to help. It requires some discipline and also some sacrifice to do our human duty. But that is true of many things in life. Therefore, the question always surprises me, how did I have the courage to help the Frank family? Because I simply could not think of doing anything else. But why? Why always this question? And step by step, slowly, I began to understand why so many people wonder why they should assist people in trouble because when we are very young we are taught and told are we not that if we are good then good things will happen to us if we are good then all will be well and so you listen to your parents and you are good and you know that everything will be all right so there, does it not follow then? If we are bad, then everything will not turn out all right. And so 
it is that we are thinking that people who have problems must have made some very bad mistake. Some serious mistake. And we think if we help them, would it not mean that we are doing a form of social injustice when we help them? Should not they receive the consequences of doing their mistake? If we help them, would this not make them weak? During the war, I often heard people say that the Jews would never have become into such deep trouble if they had not done something wrong. And I knew that many people in Holland were thinking this way, so I decided not to tell my friends and my family that I was going to help the Franks to hide. I, I knew what they would say to me, that the Jews must solve their own problems, that it was unwise of me to risk my life to help people who must help themselves to be strong, to climb out of their own trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, if you ever decide to help someone in trouble, I know that you must have courage, but what courage? You need to have the courage to face the disappointment and anger of your own friends and family who are frightened for you of what you are choosing to do. But I, I do not believe that people who are suffering trouble have done something wrong. I know this from my own life. I was born Hermann Sanstruges in Austria. And so I was five years old when World War I started. I was always a good girl. And at five years old, I did not get enough food. But why, when I am good, should it be that I should not have enough food? And by the time we reached the end of all that, by the time I was 11 years old, I caught a disease in my lungs. And so I was sent to Holland to a foster family who had more food, Amsterdam. The Netherlands had not yet been taken by the Germans. And so this foster family, they take me in, even though they already have five children. They have more food, they take care of my sickness, and they call me Meek. So you shall call me Meek. 11 years old, I learned that you can suffer great trouble and not be the blame for it. And I learned too what kindness can mean to those who are suffering. This is how I grew up. And so you will understand why I felt the same for the Jews. I helped because I had been helped and I did not want to be an old woman unable to sleep, turning over and over in my mind for all the guilt for not helping. You see, there is much of this story to tell you and I would like very much if you would bring down these lights on this stage that are so strong and theatrical. Thank you. It's much easier on my eyes. And I shall come out from behind this podium too, but you must let me have some water. I will tell you. There. Excuse me, excuse yeah. me, Ms. Geese. Yes, yeah. we are having a slight technical problem. Could yeah. you just wait one minute until yes. I fix that? Thank yes. you very much. Sit and be quiet.
everyone time to sit and be quiet. This we need more of. Thank you, Wendy, for being persistent. So I shall tell you the story the best that I can tell it. There I was in the Netherlands with my foster family and I healed from my lung sickness and grew strong on their food. And I went to a little school to learn how to be a secretary. Now you must understand the Netherlands, there was such a time of dancing. We loved to go to the dance halls and there I would go and dance on the weekends. But I went to get myself a job during the working time and I came to a company called Opetka. Opetka was run by Otto Frank. He was tall and slender and had a good, strong face. And from the very first moment I met him, I wanted without thinking to call him Papa, but I resisted. Later, I understood that he wanted everyone to think of him as Father Otto, as Papa. Now, I was given the job to my excitement, and so I came to that office there at 263 Princeton Grass, and I would sit at the table, and I would answer the telephones, and I would do the little orders to double check the orders, so they would then go into Johannes Kleinman, who was managing, and then there was also Victor Kugler, and he was doing most of the ordering and the sales. And Mr. Otto, he came straight to my desk on that third day after I was settled and he said, come with me. And so I followed with him. And he took me over a little bit into the office there, into the kitchens where we would have our coffee there. And laying out on the counter, all so clean, was a bowl and a weight and for measuring, and there was Opecta, our product that we were selling. What was it? It was pectin, so that you could make your own jam. You would not always have to buy it at the big prices. You could take your own fresh fruit, or you could take the three-day-old fruit, even better, and you could mix it and weigh it with just the right amount of sugar and the pectin, and with the right amount of mixing, it would jam. I had lumps, so many lumps. Day after day, I worked with the measurements following the instructions, and I found that the instructions were not very clear. And I told this to Mr. Otto, that the instructions could be improved. He nodded and he smiled and sent me back until I could jam my jam without lumps. And once I had perfected the use of the product, he then put me onto the desk, he said. Now. When people call, they have questions, do they not? Yes. And do you now know the answers? Yes, I do. I know how to get out the lumps. And so I was now on the phone and taking all the calls and all the questions about how to make a smooth jam. I loved my job. Soon we added another, her name was Beth Boskul. Boskul came in and she took over much of the typing for me. And there we were, Beth and Johan and Victor and myself. And now a little way behind us from the offices were the warehouse where the product was being made and also they were making a new product of spices, pecaton spices, so that you might make your own sausages with just the right blend. That was Herman Van Pels. He was the one in charge, the herbalist for the sausages. Little by little, we all got to know each other well. And then Mr. Funk invited me to come to his house for a meal.
No, I did not go alone. I had met my soon-to-be husband, Jan Hiss. Jan Hiss was taller even than Mr. Otto, but he was very good on the dance floor. We went to sit at table with the folks and listened first before we had the courage to talk, for the conversation was, you know, all about the Germans. Not the Germans, for I was German. Mr. Otto was German, his family German. But about the Nazi German. Little by little then, I got to know the two little girls, little Annelie and Margot. And Edith, Otto's wife, was very kind, but very, very quiet. And she was very strict with both the girls. And it was Mr. Otto who made all the softness in that family, scooping up little Annelie into his lap and petting down her hair. Margot was quiet like mother, but little Annelie, she was all the brightness in that house. Curious child and very strong with all of her opinions. Sometimes when I'd listen to her, I wish that I had a spine like that too. And so they came. Now, when the Germans came to Amsterdam, Everything proceeded slow. 1940, when they overtook our city. But no, the Jews were not immediately hustled off into ghettos, not in Amsterdam. No, it was slow. Was it worse because it was slow? Little by little, first, you could not associate with the Jews. And then it was 8 p.m. curfew. All the Jews had to be into their homes. And then, of course, so you would know if it was Jew or Dutch. You would then have to have a star here, the star of David on your clothes. And then, of course, you cannot have the Jewish children going into school with the other children. So you must put the Jewish children in a school of their own. And then, of course, you cannot have those Jewish children playing with the other children. Then, of course, you have to have them give up their bicycles. A Jewish person could not get about on a bike. And then, of course, you could not see a movie or go to any of the orchestras. You must just simply be quiet. Oh, that spine growing in little Annelie. I did not feel it in my back. I felt it here in my jaw. Then it all changed. It all got very serious. July 5th, 1944. Letters arrived to the Jewish families that they must give up their eldest children and send them to the work camps. And little Margaret now was to pack up all her belongings. And it was a very long list, very specific on that list. It was as clean and tidy as anything that would come out of Johann Kleinman's office. Mr. Otto and that came and I could see what was in their faces. And then he gave some supplies to Edith and off she went and brought me in privately and sat me down and said, we must go into hiding. Will you help us? Of course, I will help you. Never a question it was. Now, immediately, they must go so that Margaret would not have to go 
away to the work camp and even the Jewish families themselves were torn trying to decide what is the right thing to do to just send their children and they will do well in the work camp and then all will be over and the war will be won or to run and hide to protect the children. And many of those children were sent to those camps that there was no goodness found there. Into hiding, the Frank family went. This is what he did. At the back of Old Petka, there was another set of offices. We had thought they were too small and used the warehouse down below instead. So they had been used a little for some experiments with the different herbs. And so that was filled slowly by Mr. Frank the whole year leading up to this time, the whole year when I did not know secretly he had supplied the place. And so now it was that I was to go in the morning on July 8th to go and to get Margot. She was the first who must go into hiding. I took my bicycle and I went and I got her and it was raining and I'm glad that it was raining because in the rain there were very few Nazis about. And when I got her to 263 printing class and I walked her up into the back stairs to the offices to the door into the annex, the actor house, Paul Margot stood there. So frightened she did not know what to do. So what could I do? I gave her gentle push. Little Margot went. And later on that day came the rest of the family. Mr. Otto and Edith and Annele came first. And they set up the supplies to make a comfortable place for them to stay. We did not know how long they would stay. As first you come in through the door, you will come a little hallway and there will be a place for Mr. Arto and Edith for them to sleep and to stay. And just beyond that would be a little room for the girls, for Margot and for Anna. And to the right was a little washroom, not very large at all, but there was a little bit of mirror there for the girls, for their young growing vanity. And then back up, a long steep set of stairs. Upstairs was a kitchen and there soon would be in a few days time the friends, Herman, Van Pels, our herbalist for the sausages from the warehouse. They too needed a place to hide and he brought his wife August and also their son young Peter. Peter had a little tiny room just up beyond second set of stairs which took you all the way up into the attic and in they were and the door was closed it was simply a door at the very beginning it was quiet all day long we came and we went every day as if we were just going to work but i would come early the tasks among the helpers was divided Johan and Victor, everyone was committed to helping. What could you do? These were our friends. Of course we would help them. All the supplies were gathered by us and Johan, of course, then began to run the company in full. Though every day, once a day, he would go up the actor house stairs and talk to Mr. Artu about the business. And Beth and I, we would go out to gather the supplies. Do you understand how frightening it was? I could not come back with a bag of supplies to feed a family of four when I was just not even married myself, a young girl living alone. No, I had to carry it in small packages. I had to go out more times every day. I had to find out where was the best places and, and who were the people who would not give us up. And so we took care of the Otto family there. And I would go up in the morning before everyone had arrived to work. And they were always standing in the kitchen in a straight line they were. And little Annele would step forward, so bold, and say, Hi, Meep, what's the news? They would give us a list of the things that they would need for the next shopping. Four months later, 
we were so frightened. Johans decided we should build a bookcase to put in front of the door. And there now they were, the seven in hiding, her mom and his wife August and their son Peter and Annele and Marco, Edith and Otto, every day and every night. So quiet they had to be while we were in the work hours. They could not even go into the little washroom, or if they did, they must just let it be. I went to see my dentist, and I learned, too, that he must go into hiding. And so I went back to Mr. Frank, and I said, Fritz Stefan, he needs a place to hide. And Mr. Otto said, come back tomorrow. And when I came back tomorrow, he said, Meep, where we can feed seven, we can feed eight. And so we brought them into hiding the dentist. He also had started doctoring. We thought that would be good so he could take care of the rest of the people there in the attic. But they made a decision to put little Annele in with the room with, from, with, the, with the dentist, with Fritz. And the quiet Margot, since she was older, in the room with Mr. Otto and Edith, there was great tension between the two. Little Anna was writing. She had arranged for herself a desk there in the little room. And since her papa Otto had brought all her movie star pictures, she had cut them and with a paste pot, she had pasted them on the walls there to make it more pretty. The pictures of the movie stars, you remember, a little Shirley Temple. I thought to myself that Anna reminded me a little Shirley Temple. She wanted to be a movie star. She would write at a certain time, long and hard, pressing there in her diary, page after page. And the dentist thought, perhaps, that he, as the adult, had more right to his time for writing. He was writing his love letters to his fiancée, Charlotte, who did not have to go into hiding. And they began to argue between the two of them. And I went about and got the best of the supplies that I could get for them, all of us doing what we could to help them, waiting on pins and needles for the ally were coming so close. And soon there would be a liberation and all of this madness would be stopped. No. It was the 4th of August, 1944, and I had come down from bringing supplies up to the front family upstairs, and then the door was open, and in the door came four Dutch soldiers and an SS officer, and they came in with their guns, and we were all told to sit, which we did. We sat still with our hearts choking us in the back of our throat. And they went straight to the bookcase. Who told them? Opened up the bookcase. And down they came. Down the eight came. They were loaded up into the SS van. And then the Nazi officer Silberbau, Karl Silberbau was his name. He came around to where I was in the office. Beth had been able to run. And there was his gun. What are you doing taking care of this Jewish garbage? His voice had accent from Austria from my very own 
home. I knew his accent. And so what I did was I did not think. I just simply stood. I came out of my chair and I stood straight as I could to him. And I said to him, you are from Austria. I am also from Austria. And I let all the Dutch accent fall out of my voice. And he stopped for a moment and just simply looked at me. And I just stood straight. Then he began to pace wildly back and forth, back and forth, like some kind of wild animal. He did not know what to do with me. And then finally he stopped and turned and looked and said, you will stay, you will not run out of our hometown. Respect, I will let you be. But if you run, then I will find you and I will find your husband too. Oh, yes, I know that you have now married. I just stood. And then he was gone. He was gone. And then I just sat and I waited for a little time. And then it was Beth. Beth came back and then Jan came back, my own husband came back and I told him everything that was happening. But I, I will not leave this place. I cannot leave this place. Be because if I leave, then they will come with the, the larger van and they will take everything. Everything that they can take will be gone unless I stay here. They took with them Johan and Victor. There was no one left, just myself and Beth and Jan. And then it was finally quiet enough and Beth had come back. I said to her, Beth, we must go upstairs and we must see what there is left from the families and save it for them. And up we went to the stairs and we found there one of them the Dutch officers or was it Silvavau I do not know this to this day they had taken out of Frank's suitcase we could not see his briefcase there but I could see all the belongings of his briefcase there it had been just emptied out strewn about so we could use that to take whatever it was that they took and there that had been put in there for safety into Otto's briefcase was little Annelie's diary. Her diary and all its papers were in there. No, they were not. Not protected by their father. Strewn. Everything was strewn. And so I felt reached up fast and I pulled up all the papers and I pulled up all the diaries. I collected all of this together and so frightened I came down those stairs. I went into my office. I sat down. I opened the desk drawer and I put them in. I will give them back to Anale when she comes back from all of this. This is where they will stay and I will give them back to little Anale. I never touched them. They simply sat there. We had slowly changed the name of the company to set it up in case this had come to pass. And so now we were Hees and Company, and it was soon that Johan and Victor found their way back to us. They had been arrested and spent a little time in work camps, but they were not Jews. So we waited and worked and kept company and I until we watched and watched the signs, the lists. Otto Frank was the only one who came back. We could not believe when we saw him. He was nothing but was. And so he came slowly back to us, began to work. We went every day to watch the lists, to find out what had happened to all the rest. Were they still alive? List after list we learned who had been murdered 
in the camps. But we never learned about Margot and Anne. The death of Edith hit him very hard, but still he went to the list every day to learn about Margot and Anne. And finally, he learned that Margot and Anne were gone. It was Yanni. Yanni had seen Margot and Anne the whole time, was always with them at every transport. And so Mr. Otto went to see Yanni Brandeis and she told him everything that she could remember about Margot and Anne. What he learned is that the family had been immediately brought to Westerbork. There at Westerbork was a work camp and you could still keep on your own dress and you still had your own hair, but you were put to work there with batteries for no reason at all, just batteries. You would have to chop off the head of the battery and separate all the pieces of the batteries, but you could still sit with each other and talk. Everyone made it there and was there for a time until the Allies were coming so close that the Germans decided that they must transport as many as they could from Westerbork to Auschwitz. And so, Margot and Anna and Edith and Otto, Hermann and August and Peter and Fritz Pfeffer were transported three days standing, huddled together, people falling sick in the side. Three days, when would the train stop? We didn't know. Out at Auschwitz there with the dogs and the soldiers with the lights so bright upon you and there were those who were working who were in the blue striped suits and they would come up and they would whisper to you, be healthy, you must be healthy. You see, they were trying to warn those. You know, the lines with Mengele, the men to one line, the women to another line, but all the elderly and infirm and anyone under the age of 15. Finally, it was 15. But she was growing tall that year and so she was not sent to the gas chambers. She went with her mother and her sister to the barracks. The barracks. First after the selection you would have to go to the little office. Yanni told us everything about the little office. There, the first thing that would happen was that you would have to strip off all of your clothes, everything that you were wearing. You had to strip off everything and stand there naked. And then your hair was cut and shaved off all your hair from all parts of your body. And a little tattoo was put there on your arm. And then you were put in groups of five into the showers. What were the showers? The showers were a little dribble of water where they were all huddled together did not get clean. Then you came out from the shower, some clothes were just tossed at you, any kind of clothes, someone's clothes, and some old wood shoes tossed at you. And then you went to the barracks to sit. How long were they at Auschwitz? Margot and Anna and Edith. Edith, Yanni said, did not eat her food just the barest little bit of her food to keep enough strength so that she could get more of her food so she could have a supply to give to little Annele and Margot. Every day was the roll call. There would be a thousand of the women standing there in front of the barracks 
breakfast, for the roll call, in neat, tidy little groups of five, five and 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 five. And the Nazi soldiers then would call out the numbers and you would have to answer. And if anyone was missing, well, then you just had to start and do it all over again. And even if someone was so sick, sometimes they would just fall there in the roll call and die and everyone would have to stay standing as they were roll called again. Yanni said, the little food that came, the, the cup of drink, was it tea or coffee? They would each take the same amount of sip because you would pass the cup to who was next to you. That was everything you did. You just always took care of whoever was next to you. You lived to stand, to hold up was next to you. So Anale and Margot, they got the scabies, the little bugs that they eat underneath the skin. And then they caught the typhoid. Skeletons, they were. Otto was separated with Peter and Hermann. They worked every day nonsense work, hard labor, and then it was time to be transported from Auschwitz. Now the Allies were coming closer and closer. They were taken then to Bergen-Belsen. Now, when they arrived at Bergen-Belsen, there were so many being transported to Bergen-Belsen to get more distant from the Allies. This was not a death camp here. No, they would not die from the gas chambers. They were to simply die from exposure. There was not enough barracks for the women, so they simply put up tents that rained so hard that first night the tents collapsed. This is where Yanni said she was at the tree with her own sister Leitje and they saw Margot and Anna. But no Edith. Edith was held back at Auschwitz and died there. Otto went to the sick barracks. Soon after that, little Anna and Margot got the typhoid, the great fever. Their little barracks, their little bunks were the ones closest to the door. Yanni would say, She'd always call out to them and they would answer, though their voices were growing weaker and weaker. Now all the women, they were saving a little bit of their food there at Bergen-Belsen. You survived by feeding the one who was next. So they all saved a little bit of their rations so that they might all have holiday, every holiday, all holiday, everyone who was in the barracks. They brought out their little scraps. It was a pile of little, and pretended that it was holiday. And they began to sing their songs, each from their own country, each from their own tradition, singing their songs, said Yanni. She could hear little Anna and Lisa lifting up her voice so strong, singing. And then five days later, there was no more singing from little Anne. Margot fell out of the bed first and died. And little Anne died in the barracks bed. All these things, Otto stood and heard from Yami and then told me to wrap. I opened up my desk and I reached in and I got little Annalee's diary, her writings. Here is your daughter. Here. And he took all that into his office and closed the door. I waited and then he called to me and said, 
I will take no appointments this day. I had already taken care of that, of course. Otto Frank published that diary of little Annelie in 1947. And I could not bring myself to read it. I did not want to read it. Out it went, little by little, person by person, reading this experience of a young girl from an actor house in hiding. And people started to come. And people started to come to 263 Prince and Grass to see this little place from this little book where it was these people who were hiding. And you can imagine, and it would let these people to come in and to see this place. And Johan decided that this is what we must do. And so we would let them in. But if they were German, then Mr. Frank would take me aside and not let me meet them. But one time he was away and a couple who were German came in to see the actor house. Well, I had a go at them. I let it out. Fierce, I let it out. I was so angry. And then Mr. Otto appeared. He was back in time and he heard and saw what I did. And he brought me back into his little office and sat me down. How many times did Mr. Otto sit meep down? Meep. Do you remember when you work the jam and you are first here, the first week that I, you are here? Do you remember that you? Oh, yes, remember. And what was it you were working when you pegged it in the jam? I was working the lumps. Yes, meep. There must be no lumps. What is this lumping? Lumping people together. Jews lumping together. Germans lumping together. Arabs lumping together. There is no lumping of people. There can be no labels. Will not lump these two Germans you see in here today. I knew them in Auschwitz. Yes, Mr. Frank. When he published the second edition of the diary, then I at last opened it up to read it. In it, Anna, she called me Meek. She did not give me a pretend name as she had given to the others. She writes, I want to go on living after my death. I am very grateful for this gift of writing, this possibility of developing myself and my writing, expressing all that is in me. Because when I write, I can shake everything off. All my sorrows seem to disappear and my courage is reborn. But, and that is the great question, will I ever be able to write anything great? Will I become a journalist or a great writer? Yes. Yes, and Frank. You will. And that is my story for this day. I am happy if you have any questions. Thank you so much. That was incredibly moving and very powerful. Um, Thank you. Yes, people have been emailing, saying absolutely gripping, incredibly gratifying. Um, we don't have any 
Okay, here's one question. Beth would like to know, did Meep go on to have children? Meep did not have children of her own. She and Jan lived happy. And Meep lived until she was 100 years old. Passed in um, 19, wait, 2010. 2010. Wow. Did Meep ever travel to Israel? Yes. And she, more than that, she wrote a book, Anna Frank Remembered, and it was very hard for her to write it. There was a woman, a writer from Los Angeles, Alison Gold, who insisted that Meep write her own story. And Meep said, Annalisa has written the story. I will not write it. And Alison persuaded her that that Annalisa wrote it from inside the attic, but Meep had lived it outside the attic, and that the two stories together would tell the whole picture. And so that is how finally Meep sat down and wrote down all these recollections that you are hearing coming out here today. I think okay. that the Holocaust is, you do know, <clears throat> when you hurt your, uh, you cut yourself. It is a day or two. When you hurt your ankle, you trip. It is longer. And so we all ask, how long does it take to heal something as large as the Holocaust? You see, we can't be patient with ourselves that we are still here, even today, being in the grief of this story because it still needs its healing so if you are moved today oh please i say to you let it just let it each time you let the tears fall and the grief fall the sorrow fall we are healing and when we heal only when we heal will we not do it again it is when we carry our griefs unmanaged and pretend that that happened a long time ago. Then things sneak up on you and start themselves over again. So we grieve and we heal little by little. Okay. Susan would like to know who betrayed them. No one to this day knows exactly who it was that betrayed, though some will say probably with the most sense that Bep, our little Bep, had sisters. And one of Bep's younger sisters had joined into the Nazi party. You see, I forgot one small thing to tell you, that they pressured me to join the Nazi party, and I, I could not, they were going to deport me which is why I married my young, married him for more reasons than that. But Beb's sister was in the Nazi party and seemed to be swept away in the fervor of it. And so some records say that it was a female voice on the other side of the poem that said that there were eight people in hiding in the offices behind OPEC but there is never any proof. Did Otto Frank remarry? Yes, Otto Frank remarried. A beautiful woman whose name I cannot call to my mind at the moment who had survived Auschwitz. And so they understood the great pain and they lived together a long, long happy time. Um, Meep, did you live the rest of your life in the, Never in the Netherlands? Yes, I did. When I first wrote my book, I did not want to write it for the Dutch. I did not want it written in Dutch because I was afraid that my book would be like saying to the Dutch people who didn't help 
it's as if I was pointing my fingers at them. It took me a long time for Alice and Gold to persuade me that everyone needs to hear the story. Whatever side they were on, it's their own decision, mostly made by fear, I think. Did you stay in touch with Mr. Frank, the rest? Yes, we did. We did. Did you and he ever go to schools to talk to children about what happened? I don't believe. I know there were uh, others. Yanni. Yanni did a lot of that. Hanale, a friend of Anna's, did quite a lot of that. I don't know specifically if uh, Mr. Frank uh, went to schools. I know he devoted his life to the museum and uh, to keeping Annele's story alive. When he first, he, he, in a, it, there is a, a moment captured on film of Mr. Frank uh, talking about the diary that when he went into his office to open the diary and he was reading the diary, he realized that he did not even know his own daughter thought of little Annele, the outside of her, her sweet good nature and her spirits and the trouble that she was having with her mother. All these things were the things he saw. But then when he read the diary, he said that he saw his daughter for the first time. The depth of who she was. Well, I think many parents of teenagers would say that they're often surprised by their children. And a child's inner life is not often shared. Um, why do you think you were not taken away with the Jews? In that moment with Silver Bauer, I, there was some recognition of place for one moment when we had the same accent. I think he was thrown back into his childhood. And you know when you are friends, when you know someone, you cannot do violence on them as easily. And so I think for that moment, he was thrown back into his childhood. And there I was with my blue eyes and my very blonde hair, very, very acceptable to look at. I went the very next day to the Nazi offices with money to try to buy or bribe whoever I could to try to get the family out. But I made, I made no luck, even looking the way that I looked, I made no luck to get them. Were you ever acquainted with Anna's stepsister, Eva Schloss? Eva Schloss was Otto Frank's new wife's daughter. Ah, excuse me. Yes. Oh, oh so his new wife's daughter. daughter. His new okay. His Otto's stepdaughter. His stepdaughter. I do not know specifically. I think that I would have known them, yes. Um. Did the dentist and the Hermans survive? They did not. They did not. Hermann in Auschwitz injured his hand in work detail and was sent to the barracks at Auschwitz. And Peter then saw that they took him to the gas chambers. Hermann went to the gas chambers. August made it all the way to Bergen-Belsen and was transported from Bergen-Belsen on to Nauen. I, I don't, uh, many names in my head at the moment, but then from Nauen she was transferred, transported the Tiergestadt. And the story of Auguste is on the way to Tergestadt. She was very weak and falling down in the trains and they thought that she died in the train when they opened her from transport. Some say that they took Auguste's body and threw it in front of the train. 
but I, I do not smell. Oh. Um, Jill would like to know, is Meep on the Avenue of the Righteous Gentiles at Yad Vashem in Israel? Oh, I, she is, she ought to be, I do not know. That is a very good question for us to do further research. I know that the Raoul Wallenberg Medal is very much like that. It is for ordinary people who do extraordinary things. Um, Harriet is commenting that Otto Frank remarried Fritzi Markowitz. All right. In 1953. Thank you. Um, Hydron comments and questions. I've read that Otto edited out parts of the diary. Is yes. this true? Yes, it is very true. In the first edition, you see, can you see him, uh, the father, he is reading his daughter for the first time and he has lost his wife and lost his daughter and lost everyone he had lived with in hiding for two years. And inside that is little secrets of a young girl. Her body is changing. She is having feelings she has never had before. At that time in his grief, he did not want to expose any of those things to the public. And then in the second edition, he was a little further along in his grief and understood that little Anna was a person of her own and that these, these revelations of a young girl will help make the book be more real to others who are feeling the ways that she felt. But at first, no, too much. Very difficult to read little Annelie's feelings about her mother, Edith. They were, they were, they were not, uh, they did not fit well the way Margot and Edith fit well. That too is often very common. Yes. Friction between mothers and daughters. Yes. Oh, it's such a sad story. Um, uh, let's see. Um, where is the original diary? Oh, I do not know. It's a very good question. That is perhaps a good question. Is that the museum, perhaps? The museum? Maybe. The actor has? I have not been. I, the person inside, Meek, Megan, has not been. Um, your story is very relevant even today. Yes. Tragically. Yes. Um, do you have any comments or observations about that? I think that it is very hard to feel. Simply, it is very hard to feel. And there are many uncomfortable feelings that people must have if they are to learn to live together. You must learn how to live with differences. And some of these differences confuse the way you understand the story in your mind. And so in order to, to not make lumps, you must feel very hard things. And it is easier to live up in your head with better feelings, excited feelings of, I belong to the right group of people. It is, it is, it is uh, less uncomfortable to feel that one is in the right group of people. And we have an answer and a way for the light to go on and to be good and beautiful life. It is easy to live in that fantasy up here in your head and not have to work with all the lumpies, all the lumps down below. This is my opinion. Charlene would like to know, what effect did telling this story have on Megan Wells? Oh, I cried a lot. A lot and after a time I realized it was good to cry that that it is healing for each of us to cry. Anna Lee cannot cry. 
we cry for Anadi. Edith cannot cry, we cry for Edith. We cry for the 10 million who were murdered. We cry their tears. And so that is what I learned as I was working with it. It, was, it is okay for each of us to stand in the place of the lost and to cry their tears for them. That helps us all to heal. Is there anything else you'd like to say to us? I am so grateful that you have taken the time to come and to sit in such a hard story. And I know that it will be with you as you move throughout the day today. And I am proud of you to let it. And as I say in my Wallenberg lecture, that we must simply help and know that if someone is suffering, that it is not them to blame. Sometimes there is trouble made by someone, but even then, what is the good of blame? We must help. Okay. Um, is there anything that Megan would like to say to us? I'm loving these Tuesdays with you. Not as much as we're loving them. I, I will miss you. Uh, we still have one more, so one more. no, no tears yet. Yeah. Um, Megan, thank you so much. This was so moving and so educational. My people, I apologize to you again. I am so sorry for the technical problems. The last thing I want to do is be on the screen. And uh, even though this is the only day of the week that I put on mascara, but still, um, and we'll just try and do better next week. Uh, next week, we learn about the story of the Chicago fire. And we can't wait. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Megan, so much. Take care. Bye-bye.